Good evening in Japan, good morning in Europe, and a very warm welcome to the virtual Japanese German Center Berlin and the virtual panel discussion on EU Japan relations beyond the strategic partnership agreement, which is organized and hosted by the Japanese German Center Berlin in cooperation with the European Japan Advanced Research Network, EJAN, the Stockholm School of Economics and the Freie Universität Berlin. Thank you all very much for joining us. My name is Phoebe Stella Holtgrün. I am the head of project management at the Japanese German Center Berlin. Please let me make just one or two organizational remarks for our audience participating via Zoom. Please keep your microphone turned off during all times except when asking a question or making a comment during Q&A. If you would like to ask questions or make a comment during the Q&A section, please raise your virtual Zoom hand and wait until the chair addresses you. Thank you. And now I would like to hand over to Dr. Julia Münch, Secretary General at the Japanese German Center Berlin for her words of welcome and the official opening of our event. Thank you very much, Dr. Holtgrün. Dear Excellencies, dear speakers from all over Europe and Japan, dear Professor Söderberg, dear Professor Blechinger Talcott, dear Professor Sturm, distinguished guests and friends, it's my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Japanese German Center Berlin to our virtual panel discussion titled EU Japan Relations Beyond the Strategic Partnership Agreement. Well, when the agreement was signed almost two years ago, after many, many years of negotiations, it marked an important milestone for our relations and it connected with great hopes. Um, the treaty was not only designed as a free trade agreement, but also as a strategic economic partnership agreement. It should above all contribute to reducing non-tariff trade barriers creating transparency and thus also strengthening ties between small and medium-sized enterprises bet between our two economic regions. Today we would like to discuss which has been what has been achieved so far and perhaps even more important will be the question of how the partnership agreement between Japan and the EU could help us to position ourselves in our future global economy. I mentioned this especially against the background of the fact that just a few days ago, in mid-November, a regional comprehensive economic partnership was signed between 15 countries in Asia Pacific, including Japan. This RCEP created the world's largest free trade area and certainly is an important sign in the sense of multilateralism, but does this mean that Europe will be losing weight in our world order? And furthermore, I'm questioning myself how EU-Japanese relations might be affected by the recent political developments, let's say, in the US or in the UK. And are increased protectionist developments due to the current corona crisis also having a negative impact on our trade relations? I am pleased that these and many other questions will be examined from different angles today. Speaking for the Japanese side, we welcome Mr. Uemura from Mitsubishi Electric Corporation. The company is also chairing the Japanese side of the EU Japan Business Roundtable. It's very great to have you here. Also zooming in from Tokyo is Dr. Klaus Fietze from the German Embassy. Thank you also very much for joining. From Italy, Milano, we welcome Professor Berkowski from the University of Pavia. From the Netherlands, we welcome Dr. Okano Heymans from the Klingendal Institute in The Haag. And from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, we welcome Professor Mitford from Trondheim. We very much look forward to your statements. And I would also like to thank our cooperation partners from the European Japan Advanced Research Network, EJAN, namely Professor Söderberg and Professor Lechinger Talcott. And as well uh, as the moderator of today's panel discussion, Professor Ström, Deputy Director of the European Institute of Japanese Studies at the Stockholm School of Economics. 
And we also would like to thank the Toshiba International Foundation for their kind support. Last but not least, we thank you all for joining and thus contributing to strength, strengthening our Japanese German and Japanese German, Japanese EU network, which is already strong, um, but is of very great importance also in the future, certainly. We look forward to a fruitful discussion and I look forward to the statements that will follow shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Münch. Next, I invite our cooperation partner, Professor Dr. Marie Söderberg, chairperson of the EYAN Executive Committee and director of the European Institute of Japanese Studies at the Stockholm School of Economics for her words of welcome on behalf of the European Japan Advanced Research Network. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought I would start by explaining what AJON is. This is actually a network based organization which has been in existence for more than 12 years right now. It's a gathering of around 20 scholars from all over Europe. We are members in France, Italy, in, in Hungary, in Norway, in Denmark, in Sweden, in Finland. Uh, UK, everywhere, and um, we have, it's a gang of European specialists on Japan, so most of our members speak very good Japanese, we publish in peer-reviewed journals, we work on Japan, various aspects of Japanese economy, politics, and society. What we have in common is also, is this interest of Europe Japan relations, which we will discuss today. And we have followed this for the last two years and every year had conferences on this topic. But since we have the strategic partnership agreement, I think we are getting closer to getting some cooperation going. Economic relations have always been very strong between uh, Europe and Japan. But in this new normal, we also have the political, the possibility of more political cooperation. And here I think actually EU and Japan have a lot of common. We have a lot of shared values. We are both for multilateralism. And if we want to stay um, on the world scene and have some impact, I think we need to cooperate. I will not say so much more, um, but I'd like to also thank the uh, Japanese uh, German Center in Berlin for hosting us. And uh, hopefully we can come back in the beginning of the summer and have a conference live in Berlin. But at this stage, we do it like this. Um, I will also answer questions if there are any on development cooperation in the panel. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Marie. Mm -hmm. And now it is my pleasure to hand over the word to our co another cooperation partner from the EON network, Professor Dr. Verena Blechinger Talcott, Professor for Japanese Politics and Political Economy at Freie Universität Berlin, for her welcome address. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Holtgrün, and um, thank you very much um, to the Japanese German Center Berlin for uh, hosting us in this um, in this digital way. Um, I am a member of the eJarn network that Marie Söderberg has just um, introduced earlier, and um, as that. In, in the function as a member, I was actually su uh, supposed to host this year's conference on EU-Japan relations. And we were all excited about having the conference physically in Berlin. And then unfortunately, uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this turned out to be impossible. Um, however, we decided to move the conference, to reschedule it to next summer, most likely in June. Um, and uh, then also because the top topic that we are talking about is so important. Um, EU-Japan relations, the uh, strategic partnership agreement, and then also what we could see uh, the development uh, from a merely economic cooperation to a more and more political one that also includes uh, security aspects, that includes strategic aspects, for example, connectivity issues. So in that way, we thought it's, it's a very important, very timely issue that we want to bring um, to the attention of 
uh, our members and also of the wider uh, community interested in Japanese politics and EU-Japan relations. So we decided to host um, a digital panel uh, this year in November. And um, while it first seemed to be kind of a um, you know, something to make up for a lost opportunity. Uh, I'm now absolutely excited. We have uh, almost 100 uh, people who registered for this event. We have quite a, a high number of uh, people here in the Zoom call. It will also be uh, visible through the YouTube channel of the Japanese German Center Berlin. So what seemed to be kind of a makeup for a lost opportunity has turned out to be a tremendous opportunity for net networking and discussion and just looking through the list of participants, I'm quite excited that um, we have colleagues from uh, all over the world um, in this, um, in this uh, Zoom call today and really also have uh, experts on Japanese economy, Japanese politics, EU relations, we have former diplomats, we have business representatives, we have uh, people from the think tank world. So in that way, um, I think this is a tremendous opportunity and I'm very excited and looking forward to our discussion now. But before handing uh, the floor back to uh, Dr. Holtgrün, let me also uh, say a few words of thank you. Um, first of all, to um, eJorn to giving us the opportunity to host in Berlin albeit just uh, virtually for now, but then also to the Toshiba International Foundation for their tremendous support and also for uh, their, their support also for the conference uh, that is still to be held. Um, and then, of course, uh, a very, very big word of thank you also to uh, the Japanese German Center Berlin for setting this up and hosting us digitally. So um, without any further ado, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion and thank you all for joining our panel this morning. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your introductory words. And now I am very happy to hand over to the chair and moderator of today's panel discussion, Professor Dr. Patrick Ström, Associate Professor and Deputy Director of the European Institute of Japanese Studies at the Stockholm School of Economics. Professor Ström, dear Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, let me first begin with expressing uh, gratitude to all our partners um, for setting this um, virtual panel up um, this, this morning and afternoon. And welcome to all our uh, participants uh, from different parts of the globe. Uh, so good morning to Europe and good afternoon to or good evening uh, to, to our Japanese participants. Um, we have, as we heard, a very distinguished and high-level panel, and we look very much forward to the discussions uh, today. Um, when it comes to some practical details, I would like to encourage the audience to be active and ask questions. And uh, when you do that, please use the raise your hand function in uh, the Zoom. Um, so when you raise your hand, uh, I can call you out and you can unmute and you can ask your, your question. And please remember to be brief when asking your question. Hopefully we have a lot of questions so we would like to accommodate as many of these questions for the discussion uh, as possible. And I think uh, what we heard so far is that we have the complementarity between the EPA and the SPA, uh, which is really, really uh, important and exciting for the future collaboration between Europe and Japan, but also the wider international <clears throat> standing of EU and Japan in connection to, to other uh, world actors. So I think that's what we're going to, to hear from our distinguished uh, panel this um, morning. And I would like to start by giving the floor to uh, Professor Axel Bekowski from University of Pavia. Um, and you will have seven minutes, Axel, and that okay. is also for, for the rest of the participants. And I will be strict and fair in trying to keep the time. So without further ado, Axel, the screen is yours, please. Thank, thank you very much, Pat Patrick. Uh, um, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, good luck with being fair with me, that's for sure. Um, but first of all, very, very briefly, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to waste my time thanking everybody in, in, um, in, in, in individually, but you know, German Japanese Center 
thank you very much. Verena from Berlin, thank you very much for, for making this possible. The colleagues at the uh, German Japanese Center, Sven and, 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 and the other colleagues, um, very, very, you know, well, well done. And, and uh, Dr. Münch, of course, uh, as the uh, Secretary General of the Center, thank you very much for, for hosting this. And, and thank you also, Patrick, for, 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 for chairing the first session. So I'll, I'll go straight into, uh, and of course, uh, hello, uh, audience, especially my colleague from, from the University of Milan, Professor Corrado Maltini, a good friend of the network, and has been active also in the network in the past. And uh, uh, very, very nice to see you, Corrado. And Corrado has got many friends here among the audience. So um, that's very good. And I see we have 73 people uh, uh, tuned in, which is, which is really good. I um, really, really appreciate this. Um, OK, Japanese um, EU-Japan trade relations, uh, 2019 and, and 20. So I'll start with the good news part. I'll start with, uh, with uh, how the EPA, the Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, was able to increase trade, bilateral trade of goods and services between Japan uh, and the EU um, uh, in the first year after it has been implemented. The, uh, the uh, EPA was implemented in February 2019 and in February 2020, so you know, roughly a month before, before uh, the crisis really broke out here in Europe, um, uh, we saw an increase of EU exports to Japan by 6.6%. Uh, okay, that's, uh, you know, it's not uh, spectacular, but it's significant uh, to the same period uh, the year before. Uh, this outperformed the growth in the past three years, which averaged 4.7%, which means that uh, the actual increase uh, through the EPA over the year is roughly 2%. So it's not 6.6, .6, but 2%. You know, again, you know, not yet the way uh, it was announced to be, but still in a, a significant uh, increase. This, of course, is going to change uh, this year um, due due to the crisis and the and the crisis of uh, of um, you know of, of trade flows and supply chains um, problems. Um, so two percent increase. Uh, Japanese exports to Japan uh, grew by six point three percent. So more or less uh, uh, the way it grew the other way around. Um, and that's also a roughly a two percent increase. So you know, roughly overall two percent increase um, of bilateral trade between 2019 and 2020. So that's uh, quite uh, that's uh, you know the first result, the first actual result and real result, uh, quantified result of uh, of uh, the the consequences of the uh, EU Japan EPA. Okay, and if you put this into, um, you know, to, just to, to, uh, to put some, some figures to it, roughly then trade uh, of goods and services between the EU and Japan is roughly, or was roughly 2019, 185 billion um, euro, more or less. Yeah, that's more or less uh, what it is. It's, um, for 2020, it's going to be different. It's going to be different. It's going to be lower, I suppose. But but who knows? You know, it's depending on how quickly trade was able to pick up and, and make up uh, some of the lost ground it lost in the first part of the year. We'll see. Um, and to put this into perspective, this is roughly, Patrick, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is roughly, I've checked on this very, very quickly, it's roughly um, the amount of bilateral trade between Taiwan and mainland China, right? That's more or less the same. Maybe there's some more trade between mainland China and Taiwan uh, than there is between the EU and Japan, but that's more or less, more or less the, uh, uh, the comparison that will make sense, right? So, but again, you know, it's, uh, there's still a lot of room, uh, you know, for improvement. If you also take into account that, you know, the trade between mainland China and Taiwan, um, you know, is, is, is roughly the same, right? And the EPA, of course, will be, uh, will be helping. Uh, in more details, if you look at EU Japan, sorry, EU exports to Japan in 2019, of dairy exports by 10.4 percent, just wine, you know, mostly, I have to say, to my chagrin, um, not Italian wine, but mostly French wine. Although we, of course, know that Italian wine is far superior, uh, you know, to um, to uh, French wine. But still, you know, the uh, the growth uh, is um, is seventeen three percent. Leather articles up by fourteen percent. Electrical uh, machinery exports, and that's Germany above, above all, I suppose, and also Italy, up by sixteen percent. Okay. And the prospects for 2020 until the crisis broke out. Um, yeah, Giborg is telling me, how dare you? She's from France. But, you know, Giborg, you know, just, just be realistic. You know, the wine in Italy is um, fruitier, let's put it this way. Um, uh, so, you know, there, there is, uh, the prospects were even better uh, before the outbreak uh, of the crisis. And uh, yeah, the, uh, the goal 
was it and still is the goal is to remove all of the uh, one roughly 1 billion euros in duties that the EU and Japan have been imposing onto each other for many, many years. And you know, we can report or we can you know, share for the report that uh, most of the, uh, of the duties, uh, you know, roughly 95% of all, of all duties have been removed already. So when the uh, EPA was implemented a year and a half ago, uh, you know, immediately, and that's, of course, I mean, that's the very nature of an, of, of an economic partnership agreement, of a free trade agreement, uh, more than 95% of all tariffs um, were removed. And, but again, you know, it's another 5% or 3.5% three, three to be removed, and this um, uh, will take place in the years, in the years ahead. So if everything, uh, when all, all are said and done, when everything is, is being removed, then the EU and Japan, at least in 2019, predicted uh, that annual trade, bilateral trade in goods and services will be, uh, or could be increased by 36 um, billion euros. So, and that would be, if you take the 185 billion um, bilateral trade figure, that would be 20% roughly. It would be, you know, uh, roughly 80, uh, you know, 180, 185 uh, plus 36. That that is um, that is 20%. You know, that was the prediction. So if if all if all goes to plan, of course it did not go to plan this year. But in, in the years ahead, if everything goes to plan, then we will will see. We could see uh, an increase um, uh, of in, in bilateral trade, not by two percent or three percent, but but by 20%. This is what uh, what um, what the statistics. Um, uh, and came of the, uh, the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, with the significantly, uh, with the significant but same collapse of uh, of world trade, new uh, trade, of course, in, included. Okay, uh, when we look at the euro in mid um, in 1920, uh, it was it was uh, it was. Uh, Trade will fully recover by 2022 in a year and a half earlier. That is probably to be taken with a lot of caution because the uh, uh, the trade, bilateral trade and multilateral trade was really taking over over July, August, September, uh, and maybe, maybe, but who knows that, you know, that remains to be seen, of course, we can, because we cannot look into the future. Um, maybe this will be, uh, with, this will be earlier than, um, 2022. You're coming up to your seven minutes, Axel. Yeah, sure, sure. I'll 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 conclude here. So prospects are are, are good. Um, the res the responses, the initial responses, and this is where the EPA, and probably the last thing I will say, um, where the EPA became very very handy and very very useful. You know, uh, the EU and Japan. You know have provided us with evidence that they're not immune to protectionist uh, policies. You know, the first tariff easing um, but very very difficult in the case uh, in the case uh, of you in Japan because you have the EPA and the EPA does not allow that sort of um, you know that sort of measures it was it was it was uh, it was attempted it was done uh, but the EPA I think as a legal and instrumental framework made it very uh, made it very very difficult and will continue to make it difficult for you in Japan to resort to um, to protectionist measures, right? And this is, of course, the way to go. But there were some attempts in the summer to do this in Japan, and of course, uh, uh, among EU member states as well. But the EU, uh, EU, Japan, EPA, I think, did a very good job, and the EU Commission did a very good jo job, making sure that these sort of protectionist measures would be limited to the very minimum. Thank you, Patrick. Well, thank you. Perfect, Axel. Thank you very much for that. And I think we have um, reasons to come back to the EPA. So now we move from uh, EU trade issues to um, the EU cooperation on digital connectivity. And I think that relates very much to the future of the STA. And to give us a presentation is uh, Dr. Um, Maike okano Heyman from uh, the Klingendal Institute in Den Haag, where she is working as a senior uh, research fellow. So Maike, the screen is yours, please. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick, and uh, to all the others for, uh, for having me, and of course, um, for our colleagues for hosting us. I'm, I'm really very happy that we're having this eJourn event. 
um, that we decided not to skip the COVID year, um, but still get together. And I think it's amazing. So after having 70 people online, I think it shows that it was really worth the effort. Even though I have to say, I'm, I'm very lucky um, that we, I didn't have to make much effort. So again, thank you for hosting this so perfectly. Um, I would indeed like to uh, call um, to highlight um, a bit of what has been happening in the connectivity field, because of course Japan and um, and uh, the EU signed a connectivity partnership in September 2018, a year after the EU came up with its own connect connectivity strategy, um, and a few years after Japan came up with its quality, sustainable and uh, quality infrastructure partnerships. Um, so combining the two, this uh, developed into this connectivity partnership. Um, so uh, a year uh, later, I think it's really um, well useful to, to look at what has been achieved so far. Um, and to me, um, to give away my conclusion, I think it's a little bit of a mixed bag um, because we've seen tangible steps, um, but at the same time, um, well, there's, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and in uh, discussing this partnership, I'd like to focus a little bit on digital connectivity because I think that is where really the future lies. Um, connectivity is, a, is about transport. We all know the roads and the railways, uh, much has been discussed. Um, human connectivity, um, exchanging more uh, people and, and think and their thoughts, of course, but really digital is where the world is heading because in this fourth industrial revolution where ICT is really entering everything of our society and uh, well, COVID-19, of course, highlighted again how important digital is to our lives, how fundamental. Um, but also how much uh, freedom of online engagement, for example, is um, and how we differ uh, with certain actors in, in the world. Um, so it, the digital field is really uh, an important one for the future. Um, because, of course, the technological developments will only um, well, go faster in increasing um, and in changing our societies. So we really have to, to get to common action and to common regulation. Um, to deal with uh, future challenges, or actually today's challenges um, that are already out here. Um, and of course, the United States-China tech conflict um, is crucial to this. We both do not want to be um, play balls or um, play fields in this tech conflict between the two giants. Um, so the EU and Japan have reason to cooperate here. Um, to, um, I think developments that I would like to highlight that where I do see that the EU and, and Japan have started to cooperate in the digital uh, connectivity sphere. Uh, one is uh, again related to COVID-19 uh, because of course um, the, the, at the beginning of this pandemic um, it was clear that well partially because of the lack of freedom of, uh, of speech online in China uh, the, co the, the spread of the virus was so much faster than it might have been if people were, would have been allowed to speak out. So in that sense, the, the limitations on the freedom of speech in certain regions is clearly impacting um, on what is happening in our um, societies, um, but also uh, the disinformation that came out and that was allowed to spread also through digital means. Um, so I was very happy to actually to see that in the last summit in May, uh, the EU-Japan summit, uh, both parties decided to cooperate on disinformation and to, to stop, um, well, to try to limit the spread of disinformation, particularly online, because of course with social media, the spread of disinformation can, can go so much faster than otherwise. Um, so that's a really, I think, a tangible, um, well, success, at least in, in a new sort of uh, field that is, is taking up to address. A second one that I would like to highlight is the Indo-Pacific. Um, and of course, the Indo-Pacific, the, the EU was hesitant for, for many years to engage with this concept um, for different reasons that we can uh, discuss later. Um, but for the first time, the Indo-Pacific was mentioned in an official uh, EU document in this EU-Japan partnership. Um, so it was really then, I think that it was a, a success on the part of the Japanese to engage Europe with this concept. And we've seen most recently the Netherlands, my own country, come up with an Indo-Pacific guidelines. Uh, after, of course, Germany a few months ago already came up with this. And the, together with France and, and several other countries, we are there now pushing for more engagement also at the EU level. 
Um, and I think if we get a digital turn, so to say, in this Indo-Pacific engagement of the EU with Japan, we can really make tangible steps with cooperation um, in the context of this um, connectivity partnership. Um, in my remaining time, the little time that I have still, um, let me highlight three subsets uh, where I think uh, very relatively less has been done um, and, and where really big uh, opportunities still lie ahead. Uh, one is a big tech platform regulation. Um, both the EU and Japan suffer from not having uh, really big tech companies uh, of the like of Google, Amazon uh, from the United States, but also uh, Alibaba, uh, Tencent from China. So it's really the Chinese and the American companies that ruled uh, this sector. And I think this uh, has, is problematic in the sense that also it does not allow the EU and Japan to really regulate when they should. Um, so to cooperate on, on being, becoming more um, you know, innovative and, and commercializing some of the great innovations that ha are being developed, I think the EU and Japan can, um, can do better and as an extension of that also then um, uh, regulate better. Um, so the standard setting of digital norms is, is, is a second um, element where I've been in, in discussions on a, the, what the EU calls a human-centered approach, what Japan calls Society 5.0, and what the two have in mind, despite the differences in, in, in language, is, is really the, the, the idea to put people first. Um, so whereas sometimes it's said of the United States that big tech goes first, uh, of the Chinese that the state goes first, I think the EU and Japan share this uh, approach to putting people first, um, and they've come very far. EU GDPR is, of course, an important one, and that has also uh, led to uh, legislative changes in many other countries, including in the Indo-Pacific. Um, but I think the two can do more. Um, and the final point, um, because I realize I'm running out of time here, um, the final point that I think I'd like to make is uh, cooperation on digital ODA. I'm not sure if Wilhelm Vosse is, uh, is present here with us, but I wrote uh, a piece with him earlier this year on digital cooperation, uh, where also I think the EU and Japan should cooperate in third countries. Um, and that includes, of course, countries in the Indo-Pacific, but it includes also countries in Europe's own neighborhood. Um, where the digital divide is broadening. Um, so we have to make sure that we fight poverty also by looking at digital tools. Um, they have also oftentimes, well, not really been recognized, I think, in, uh, by European traditional donors, um, that digital tools can be very useful also to spur development, but it's also to make sure that, for example, cybersecurity is in place in specific third countries. Japan, of course, has been acting in uh, Southeast Asian region already on this. I believe it is in Thailand that they have a cybersecurity center that tries to engage with ASEAN countries. Um, and I think uh, the EU and Japan would do well to cooperate further in this field. Um, so I'll leave it to that because uh, seven, time, seven minutes is up. Back Excellent. To you. Thank you very much, Maike, for um, very good uh, insights on this. So we move from the cooperation on uh, connectivity and digital issues uh, to the cooperation on energy issues, which is also a very important part, of course, within the sustainability aspect of the collaboration. And to give a short um, statement, we have with us Professor Dr. Paul Milford, who is a professor at the Department of Sociology and Political Science and director of the NCNU Japan program, joining us from Trondheim, Norway. Paul, the screen is yours, please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that kind intervention, uh, uh, introduction, uh, Patrick. And I want to start by uh, thanking the German uh, uh, Center, uh, the Japanese German Center in Berlin and the Free University of Berlin for um, their excellent preparations, their very thorough and excellent preparations and sponsorship of this web seminar. Um, and in this, uh, I also want to just echo what uh, Maike say, uh, said, and that I'm uh, really happy that we've been able to arrange uh, this seminar as a partial, but nonetheless, uh, really valuable substitute for our annual meeting. And despite the uh, kind of challenges we've had in, in, in 2020. Um, so in this brief presentation, I'm uh, going to make several points, six points uh, in particular about EU partnership uh, regarding um, uh, energy and more broadly the environment and sustainability. Um, particularly, I'm going to focus on uh, renewable energy and say something about uh, electrification of transport and their uh, key roles moving forward. 
Now, first, I want to emphasize my first point is that the EU and Japan are um, the two global leaders in combating global climate change and promoting renewable energy. That's because they're two of the uh, four leading economies in the world, and they're the two that I would argue have been most consistently committed to combating climate change. Second, the areas where the EU and Japan should deepen their bilateral cooperation, um, just to jump right into very specifics, include things such as smart grids, integrating uh, national uh, and regional grids through tie lines, greater usage of renewable energy, maintaining uh, and enhancing their technological competitiveness in, for example, storage batteries, other storage technologies, uh, battery powered electric vehicles, and not least of all, promoting the hydrogen economy. These are areas where both sides have been learning from each other over uh, the past couple of decades. Of course, Japan uh, pioneered the development of photovoltaic solar panels in the 70s and 80s, and then made them commercially viable. Um, Europe has really been, uh, 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 setting, um, establishing a leadership role, particularly in terms of establishing regional uh, uh, grids that help to uh, integrate uh, greater amounts of solar and wind power and other renewable energy into the grid. Uh, and also in terms of developing regional energy markets like Nord Pole here in, in Scandinavia that are, are also very useful for uh, integrating more and more uh, renewable energy into the grid. Uh, my third point is that the EU and Japan have a uh, leading role in partnering with the incoming Biden administration to try to coax the US back, fully back into the Paris Agreement, which might not be quite as easy as you might think in that you will have, uh, may have a, Cong a US Senate that is not necessarily very enthusiastic about that idea, um, but try to coax the US fully back into the Paris Agreement and also um, the promotion of renewable energy and uh, electrification of uh, transport. Those are other, again, areas where uh, the, U the US participation is vital if, we, uh, if uh, uh, the EU and uh, Japan can uh, fully engage the US. Um, uh, however, and, and also I would, uh, my fourth point then is that the EU and Japan, I think also have a vital role to play uh, as bridges for promoting environmental and renewable energy cooperation between China and the United States. Um, I think there is real possibility um, that that's one area where I think the incoming Biden administration and China uh, have a lot of room for cooperation where they have similar views on the importance of uh, uh, combating climate change and, and where there's a lot of room for cooperation that incidentally might spill over into other fields and might uh, allow for some kind of detente between the US and China so that uh, we can have a, a more stable global um, uh, security outlook. Um, and, and, and also uh, economic and trade outlook as well. However, in the longer term, this is my fifth point, there is no replacement for EU-Japan partnership on the environment and energy uh, as the US um, uh, is not necessarily going to be committed to renew to combating climate change over the longer run. Uh, sadly, I have to say as an American, it look, seems to me that the, U the US political system has fallen into what seems to be a kind of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of system of extreme, or one might even say kind of schizophrenic political swings between left and right. Um, so it's quite conceivable, uh, sadly, that by 2025, the US might again have a, a, uh, an administration that is uh, in climate denial again. So um, we can't necessarily count on the US being back uh, in the Paris Agreement and as an ally in fighting climate over the long run, much as we might want to. Uh, that leads to my sixth and final point, which is that the EU and Japan need to cooperate with each other to effectively um, uh, cooperate with China, to engage ch uh, China as well. Uh, but at this, well, even while uh, cooperating with China, uh, the EU and Japan also need to uh, recognize that they have to compete with China as well. China has emerged quite bluntly as uh, the leader in most environmentally friendly technologies today, starting with solar panels where they uh, control like over 60% of the market. Um, the only one air exception to that is hydrogen. Uh, Japan has really emerged as a hydrogen leader. The EU can learn a lot from Japan. Japan has a national hydrogen strategy. I recommend the EU also develop its own hydrogen strategy and that the two establish a hydrogen council and, and cooperate bilaterally on that. 
Um, but in terms of uh, China's leadership, this is especially uh, uh, proved to be true now in battery powered electric vehicles where China uh, this market is now larger than the rest of the world combined. And we are now beginning to see a large wave of uh, battery powered electric vehicles from China sweeping over the European market this uh, year and next. Um, now, and a related technology are grid storage batteries that are key for expanding the use of wind and solar power. Now, China's achievement in environmentally friendly technology and commercialization of those technologies, to be sure, that's a real benefit for the global environment that we should all welcome. Uh, but Europe and Japan also need to cooperate with each other to maintain their competitiveness um, and technical autonomy in these areas, and also in broader industries like the automobile industry, just as they need to cooperate uh, to maintain the digital economy, as uh, Maike was talking about, from China, and also reclaim their digital autonomy from the United States. And with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Paul, for very insightful comments. Uh, I'm very sure we'll um, continue the discussion. So let us now move to the uh, business perspective, where we um, look at EU-Japan trade and SCA um, agreement. Um, and uh, to join us, um, we have um, Uemura-san, um, Noritsugu, who is a corporate executive for government affairs and external relations of Mitsubishi Electric Corporation, joining us all the way from Tokyo. Uh, please, the screen is yours. Thank you for introduction of myself. I am Uemura from work for Mitsubishi Electric, and also I am performing a, a main shelf of the co-chair company of uh, the EU Japan Business Roundtable. And uh, uh, already three speakers spoke about the issue of Japan and EU cooperation from the perspective of trade, digitalization, energy, connectivity. So the, from my side, you know, uh, I would like to report about you know, uh, what kind of things we discussed at the business round table. Uh, we had the annual meeting uh, earlier this month. So the first, I would like to point out that EU-Japan relations are not something new like uh, started yesterday, but have already had a long history and a firm basis. For example, Mitsubishi Electric, our company, was founded in Japan and 1921 and expanded into Europe in 1969. At present, we have established our own sales companies for air conditioning systems, automotive equipment, and factory automation products, etc., in 21 European countries, including Germany, and uh, operate nine factories as well. We have uh, 50 years history in Europe, and many Japanese companies are nearly the same. About one and a half years have passed since the EU-Japan EPA came into force, and the trade volume between the EU and Japan has mutually increased by about 6%, according to the last year's data. The utilization rate of preferential tariffs on both sides has exceeded 50%. The recent trade between the EU and Japan has been relatively stable despite the negative impact of the COVID-19 in the first half of this year. Well, thanks to the solid foundation of the EPA. With such a long history and a solid foundation, EU-Japan relations have completed the phase one and have now entered into the phase two, the stage for the deeper relationship. The challenge is for SME to more easily use the EPA. The BRT will also work with JETOLO and the EU Japan Industrial Cooperation Center to develop SME's understanding how to use EPA. Secondly, I'd like to address the areas in which EU Japan cooperation should be deepened. As mentioned by various uh, previous speakers, the government and the business sector, both in EU and Japan, now exactly focus on green and digital. With regard to green, the EU is leading the world in its green deal initiative. In Japan, Prime Minister Suga announced a climate neutral declaration by 2050. Also the latecomer, Japan's entry into the same stage at the EU, as the EU is expected to accelerate cooperation between both sides. At the annual meeting of the BLT, for example, cooperation between EU and Japan, Japanese companies, in the plastic recycling business and the clean hydrogen project were introduced. 
activities to realize a circular economy and decarbonize the society have already started. In particular, climate neutral by 2050 can be achieved by extending the existing technology, but requires innovative technologies. In this context, it is important for the EU and Japan to cooperate from the R&D stage and strengthen activities in innovation. The next is digital. With COVID-19 pandemic, the lifestyle of people is rapidly shifting to the digital, so-called uh, digital transformation, such as spreading e-commerce, teleworking, and online lessons. As a result, business world is facing many challenges. For example, the realization of non or less contact remote, decentralized industrial social structure. In order to solve these problems quickly and efficiently, each company is rushing to introduce and utilize digital technology such as IoT and AI. In particular, business sector is paying much attention to data utilization as the key to uh, digital transformation acceleration. The EU has GDPR for personal data and Japan has uh, act on the protection of personal information, so-called APPI. In February last year, the EU adopted its adequacy decision on Japan, helping to facilitate data transfers. There is now a growing momentum to encourage the distribution and utilization of the industrial data in order to facilitate innovation. So far, those data have not been much used. In the EU, Large-scale government initiatives such as GAIA-X and the common European data space are steadily moving forward, focusing on data-driven innovation. Japanese government is also playing a role in promoting data free flow with trust, so-called DFFT, and is heading exactly in the same direction as the EU. It is said that the area of competition and area of cooperation should be classified in corporate strategy Assuring a common sense of values, the EU and Japan can make data sharing and utilization as an area of cooperation across companies, countries, and regions. By doing so, it could be possible for both and the EU and Japan to compete with the United States and China in terms of data volume. The South, in relation to the theme of this conference, I'd like to touch upon the strategic relationship between the EU and Japan. As COVID-19 has accelerated the changing speed of the society, the strategic collaboration with strong partner has become more important for the business sectors. Strategic collaboration, typically between companies, has recently become more prominent in the form of consortiums and alliances. For example, in the field of factory automation in Japan, there is a movement to form a platform for FAIT equipment at edge layer, which is close to the user side. That is Edge Cross Consortium established in 2017, in which we need to be selected as a core member. Edge Cross has, endorsed, has been endorsed by a number of companies, including Siemens AG and Schaeffler AG of Germany and now has around 400 members globally. Edge Cross is a technology, technology platform for the FA, but I personally believe it is also a platform for strengthening strategic relationship in business sector. Another example is establishment of the Clean, uh, Clean Hydrogen Alliance of the EU this July. At the BRT meeting, uh, European Commissioner Mr. Breton a call on Japanese companies to join the hydrogen alliance to which the EU put much importance as a new energy source. The alliance has more than 700 members, including several Japanese companies, and I hope it will become a platform for strengthening the EU and Japan strategic relationship. So how should we engage in strategic collaboration? The EU-Japan BLT is looking at the two schemes. One is regulatory cooperation, and the other is third country investment cooperation, so-called connectivities. So more details will be provided later in the Q&A session. So please allow me to conclude my first remarks here. Thank you.
Thank you very much, um, Murasan, for your comments. Um, and now we switch from the uh, business side to the diplomatic side. And uh, to join us to talk about the SPA and the Indo Pacific dimension is Dr. Klaus Witze, Minister and Deputy Chief of Mission at the Embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany to Japan. So, Dr. Witze, the floor for the screen is yours. Um, thank you, Professor Ström, and uh, thanks to all colleagues of the Japanese German Center, and allow me to greet my many old friends I discovered on these screens here. <laughs> um, when Germany published its Indo-Pacific guidelines uh, this September, uh, we were kind of overwhelmed by the very positive reaction from the Japanese side. I think it's the same experience our uh, colleague from the Netherlands uh, explained about. And if you could compare this to the reception of the SPA in the beginning, which was really not enthusiastic, it was a kind of a stepchild of the EPA, then you see a considerable change in the Japanese attitude uh, towards the political dimension of the EU and the political importance of the EU for Japan. Um, especially today, so the increasing rivalry between the US and China uh, doesn't leave us an option. Decoupling for chi from China is not an option for anybody. We all need workable solutions and therefore more dialogue, especially among important players like the EU and Japan. Um, we both have a very strong presence in the region, but we can certainly do more, coordinate better, and also strive, we should strive to become, become more visible with our efforts. We all hope that under the new Biden administra administration, first the EU will play a more constructive, constructive role in the region, but we also hope uh, that uh, this will open more political space for the Japanese side uh, for more active support for the multilateral systems and more for more cooperation with European partners. That will, that will make our cooperation much easier. For Japan, it's interesting to uh, figure out which uh, role the EU can play in foreign security policy in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the EU and the European member countries have always promoted the rule of law in international relations, uh, freedom of navigation, sustainable development strategies, and we also have also tried to contribute to peace and stability, especially also in the Indo-Pacific. Um, the SPA has already become the basis for enhanced consultations between the EU and Japan. I think um, most of the more high-level results you will only see uh, starting from next year because of the COVID situation, but the formats have clearly been at, at enhanced and um, are on a different level now. Japan is looking for an increased uh, maritime presence of EU member countries uh, in the IPR. But the SPA has also opened the door this year for the first joint naval exercise between an EU mission, that is Atalanta, and uh, Japan. Uh, the, the first joint naval exercise in the Gulf of Aden and the port call in Djibouti were first major steps in this direction. To cooperate with Japan in the Indo-Pacific region, I do think we need a country-by-country -country approach. Uh, Japan's strategy in the Indo-Pacific follows the paradigm that where the uh, EU, the US or Europe uh, uh, reduces its engagement, uh, China will always be there. And uh, Japan seems to be convinced that in order to provide alternatives, you simply have to engage. Um, therefore, Japan has, for instance, been ready to increase its engagement in, in Myanmar, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, at a time when the EU or certain EU member states uh, have been more reluctant to do so, certainly by good reasons. So because of this uh, different approach uh, for the EU and Japan, a country-by-country -country dialogue is absolutely necessary. 
And this dialogue has already significantly increased under the SPA framework. So Germany, is, for instance, supports the EU project Enhanced Security in and with Asia, a series of uh, EU-Japan 1.5 dialogue uh, meetings in Asian countries starting in 2021, which is clearly going into this direction. On connectivity, the EU became uh, the basis, uh, the SPA became the basis for the EU-Japan Connectivity Agreement, but this was only signed by Juncker and Abe in 2019. Um, we look to Japan also because uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy has been quite successful under the Abe administration. And it has, Japan has clearly strengthened its position as uh, one of the most important, important partners for trade and investment in many of the larger ASEAN countries. Especially at a time when the uh, Belt and Road Initiative is facing uh, considerable obstacles, the Japanese strategy for investment in quality infrastructure is, very well, is a very welcome addition and sometimes also already an alternative for many countries along the Belt and Road. In the framework of the EU-Japan connect Connectivity Agreement, uh, the EU has already uh, set up considerable funds to develop a joint projects with Japan and is now in the process to establish the first uh, flagships, flagship projects in third countries. But uh, knowing the EU, then uh, the time from uh, 2019 until today has been relatively short and uh, we, sh we should uh, give them some time also to come out of the uh, COVID situation. I think that this kind of uh, connectivity discussions will also give additional momentum to the country by country uh, dialogue mechanisms that will provide some, some fuel, if you want to call it this way. Um, as, some of the, as some of the speakers before me, I see uh, um, large opportunities on the new security issues. Um, the SBA already mentions uh, fields for cooperation like energy security, climate change, cybersecurity, where Japan is actively look, looking for cooperation with the EU and EU member states. The Corona crisis added uh, medical security to the short, short list of new social economical security problems. The consultations within the WHO framework and the cooperation on COVAX between the EU and Japan have already been enhanced. Dr. Witzer, uh, you're yeah. coming through to your seven minutes, I'm afraid. Uh. Uh, we also uh, see with interest that the uh, new Minister for, uh, for uh, Ecological uh, Affairs here Mr. Koizumi uh, has an initi initiative for green recovery of, uh, after COVID-19. And uh, I think Japan's joining of the international platform on sustainable finance clearly points into the direction of more cooperation with the EU in this field as well. Um, well, I just wanted to point up a few, uh, point out a few positive things about the SPA, and I hope I think I hope I managed to do so. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Witzer, for your very clarifying input on this. So um, now it's time to use the rest of the time that we have for discussions, and I encourage uh, our audience to use the raise uh, hand function, and we will distribute the questions uh, to the specific panelists or to the entire panel. Um, I already have one question, which is related to trade. Um, so maybe uh, Axel could start, but I think it also connects very well to, to the rest of the panel. And that is from uh, Clementina Cardoso, who asked, what is the predominant role of trade in nurturing and maintaining cooperative political and societal relations between the EU and Japan and the wider Asian region? So as a uh, trade as a facilitator, I presume. So Axel, would you have a go on that for the first? Yeah, yeah. I, if, if I may, uh, there, there was another question that was uh, directed on trade also, if I may. 
uh, a bit more. The other one is good too. I'll, I'll come to this very quickly. But yep. uh, a colleague, colleague asked, um, because I mentioned in my talk, uh, trade restrictions and protectionism, you know, in the EU and Japan. Um, and very, very briefly, and it's a good question because I did mention this. Uh, it's export subsidies, essentially, during the crisis. It's, um, it's uh, you know, export restrictions other subsidies plus and this was a big issue in Japan at least in mid 19 uh, sorry mid 2020 reshoring you know uh, uh, re relocating production away from uh, from out of Japan into Japan financed by the gov by the Japanese government co-finance and this was certainly not directly related to EU EU Japan to the EU Japan EPA but it's an issue that, that was you know very vividly discussed and also criticized inside of Japan and in and outside of Japan so reshoring um, as a protectionist measure, if you will, uh, financed by the government. You know, this is this is what was taking place mid 2020. Whether it will go on and whether the, the government, you know, will remain committed to doing this uh, remains to be seen. But this was probably a warning shot to as to to what can happen when a crisis like this breaks out. Patrick. Yep. Yep. That's uh, the the subsidies. Okay. The other one or the. Or shall we pass well, it on? It's yeah. trade as a facilitator for nurturing relations between the EU and, and Japan. Yeah, yeah, on, no, on I've, I've seen the questions. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, what can I say? I mean, it's a it's a very wide ranging question. Sure, you know, trade yeah. and economic interdependence always uh, is um, is you know also facilitating people to people exchanges. You know, and um, certainly if you know if 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 you have countries like. Uh, uh, like like Japan and, and and China trading with each other, they don't go to war with each other. I mean, it's it's a very very wide ranging answer to a very wide ranging question. But yeah, it is a facilitator of uh, uh, economic interdependence. Is uh, an obstacle to military conflict, if you want to put it this way. Should, yeah. Is there anybody else of the but, panel who wants to comment on, on the uh, trade as a facilitator, or if it's not, we should move to the next question, and that is um, uh, Professor Verena Bleichinger. Talcott. Hey, um, yeah, thank you very much um, for giving me the opportunity to ask a question. Thank you very much um, to the panel for the ex inspiring input. Um, I wonder, you know, if we have now that uh, we're looking back at the uh, time of the uh, SBA um, that it has started, um, we heard both, uh, I think, in uh, Uemura-san's um, input and also in uh, Dr. Fietz's input that there has been an increase in, in consultations. And, and that is something I would like to hear a little bit more about from the panelists. So there's always one to conclude a contract and to write um, uh, um, to write a, a partnership agreement, but the other thing is how to put it uh, to work and how to make it um, a, a living uh, a structure. So in that way, uh, I would like to hear uh, what kind of um, effects um, you see in your area, and that's something maybe to everyone on the panel, what kind of effects you see in your area of the SBA? Has there been an increase in activity? And if so, in which way uh, do we see uh, the EU and uh, Japan coming closer together. And then on the other hand, uh, what I found highly interesting that also came in uh, several of the uh, inputs, um, how, do, how do we look at, uh, on the one hand, EU-Japan um, uh, cooperation, and on the other hand, bilateral country cooperation? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uemura, maybe if you would like to comment on the question from Professor Bleichinger. What companies see as a yes? So, could you repeat again the, the question? Yeah, the question was: um, since the EPA was concluded, do you see an increase in meetings, in activities between uh, the Japanese side and the European side? Um, you talked about the business uh, roundtable that has been meeting. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about um, in which way the EPA um, and, and the strategic partnership agreement have affected your cooperations with European counterparts. Mm -hmm. Well, the well, as I already reported in my uh, initial speech, you know, the trade volume uh, itself has been uh, increased at both sides. And uh, the so the also I mentioned about you know the our relation 
uh, has already completed you know, uh, the phase one, and uh, we are now entering into the phase two, so deepening the relationship. In this sense, no, the, uh, the, also in the BLT, we discuss about you know, uh, digital uh, climate issue, uh, the, well, basically in the green and the, uh, digital, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, possibility and a potential to cooperate each other. So uh, I also mentioned about you know the EU and the Japan. Uh, now we have uh, on the same stage of uh, uh, green, so that the uh, well in order to solve the so many various you know, challenges in the green issue, uh, digital uh, technology is uh, key to find out the solution. So in this sense, you no. Know, uh, also from the R and D stage, uh, the Japan and the EU can cooperate. For example, uh, in the SBA, so the science technology innovation is also the one of the topic in the SBA, and uh, uh, EU's you know, Horizon Europe and the Japan's you know uh, Moonshot Innovation Program. These are the kind of the you know uh, the target for the uh, cooperation. Uh, between these two countries, so that the even in the innovation, so the Japan EU can cooperate from now on and uh, deepen the uh, relation, uh, tighten the relation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anybody else from the panel who wants to to comment on that issue? Um, I have another comment or, or question uh, regarding the potential of creating a digital market um, from from uh, Mike. Uh, and I think that that relates also to to, to uh, the the discussions with the the SPA uh, agreement. Um, Dr. Victor, do you have any comments on on the potential of, of uh, creating a digital market or between the uh, the um, Japan and wider Asia European context? Uh, not so much on the digital agenda, but uh, I mean, I have a, a list in front of me of all the political dialogues which took place uh, even during the COVID situation and of the plans for next year. And uh, it's more than an impression that this is clearly an enhanced effort by both sides and uh, a new uh, uh, a new participation of the EU by the by the Japanese side as an important player is absolutely visible. I mean, Japan has also understood that uh, the the ways of funding for certain projects goes through the EU, and that there are more options uh, if you are in direct contact with them. Yeah, and um, well, uh, to avoid reading the list to you all. <laughs> I would just stop with this impression of mine. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Um, we, we have an, an, another question coming in. Um, or somebody wanted to comment? We, ha we had another question coming in from the audience on the um, digital ODA that was mentioned uh, by Maike. Um, if you could elaborate more. Um, on, on the, the digital ODA concept. Sure, yes. Well, I think digital ODA is, um, is basically it's support for third countries on, on digital infrastructure, on digital competence, mm -hmm. um, because of course, it's not just about digital skills, you know, having a computer, but it's also about knowing what you're giving to a company or to a state when you start using certain applications. So that's digital competence. Um, and it's also about developing an e-economy um, and about regulation of the e-economy. So there's, um, which, which relates to cybersecurity and resilience. So there's, there's really many different elements that come with digital ODA. And I think it's basically um, your, um, your traditional ODA, but taking that to the digital field. Um, and as we all know, I think many of the um, well, European donors in, in the development assistance field, um, they've been traditionally steered to poverty reduction, um, not so much to developing economies, but in this, uh, in this new um, environment uh, where the digital economy is everywhere in society, 
on the one hand, this provides many opportunities. Um, for example, in India, I think there's a great initiative um, of the, the of finance um, using all digital tools to help bring um, financial um, support, for example, to women in uh, you know that are pregnant mm -hmm. in in rural areas where otherwise they could not be delivered um, funds or medical support. Um, so it it really helps in many ways to um, also to alleviate poverty, um, but it also um, I think is something is a field where in Europe because we have such developed societies uh, because our um, well medical um, uh, well the, the health facilities are so well developed um, where our economies are still relatively more traditional so we have um, other developing countries leapfrogging us in a sense with uh, the digital economy so there's many opportunities I think of the digital uh, for development agenda that, that also we do not grasp so we have to cooperate in third countries with third countries um, and for example, also um, empowering India to share its experience with other countries in the world, because India, as I said, in, in this um, development uh, field, uh, digital for finance, um, they are very well developed domestically. They have some great initiatives, but they do not yet have the capacity to take that to third countries. Um, so here's an opportunity for the what we call in tradition in, in the digital uh, or in the ODA field, I think, a third country cooperation, uh, where, well, basically, for example, in this case, Japan and the EU could help India to go to in Bangladesh or to um, to African countries to help deliver these benefits to people. And in doing so, we can also engage with the people there on the conditions basically of what internet do you want? Do you want an open and transparent uh, and free internet? Um, or you know, will you allow certain governments uh, to take more control? Um, and I think that's uh, also a very important discussion having with these countries. Thank you very much, Maike. Um, going back to the issue of, of sustainability and uh, directing uh, more towards what, what you were talking about, Paul, um, where, where do you see the future collaboration lie between Japan and, and EU countries in terms of energy, in terms of sustainability issues? Uh, will there be co-optition or will we see uh, more of cooperation in, in certain areas, in, in power generation and other aspects? Um, thank you for that question. Um, I, I think uh, the, uh, there's more potential for cooperation than there is for competition, although of course there will be obviously be elements of competition too. Again, partly because the EU and Japan are kind of situated between these two uh, superpowers, um, the United States and China. And again, particularly in terms of technology, um, the EU and Japan will need to cooperate to kind of maintain their competitive edge, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China, which is now really uh, the global leader in, uh, again, areas like battery storage, which is really what's powering uh, a very, uh, potential for great expansion of uh, use of uh, wind, uh, expanded use of wind and solar. Uh, but again, one area where Japan remains the technological leader and where the EU can learn from Japan is in terms of hydrogen. The hydrogen economy, the Abe administration has launched a national hydrogen st uh, strategy. Uh, they're beginning to produce, they, they built a very large uh, hydrogen uh, manufacturing facility in Fukushima prefecture that will make so-called green hydrogen, hydrogen produced from solar power and wind power, not from say coal, which is where the hydrogen from Australia is coming from. And of course you can do um, carbon uh, sequestration of that, but still that's not as environmentally friendly. So hydrogen is a key area for cooperation. Also, we've been talking about digitalization. Uh, smart grids are uh, the digitalization part of um, uh, energy policy in the sense that, you know, you've always had to have uh, very, uh, uh, um, uh, a flexible management of electricity because demand is always changing, but now you have demand and uh, supply changing together and you need uh, grid, you need uh, smart grids that allow for managing demand as well as supply and quickly reallocating resources. So that's an area where both the EU and Japan can learn from each other. Japan can learn from the EU in terms of how to integrate large national grids um, and also some aspects of rollout of smart grids. Japan, on the other hand, has been a leader in terms of smart grid technology with, uh, in some recent years, uh, almost half of new patents for smart grid technology coming from Japan. So those, I think, are some of the key areas 
uh, where the two can cooperate. But I think it's more going to be cooperation rather than uh, competition. And but more generally, just finally, I think there is more. <clears throat> um, there's also, of course, vast room for cooperation with the U.S. Although, again, uh, the staying power of the U.S. In, as a partner is, I think, something we have to keep in mind. And also with China, which basically shares an interest in, uh, and I think a commitment in terms of fighting um, uh, uh, climate change. But um, they are also, as I say, a potential, they have the potential to be to uh, overwhelmingly dominant if we're not careful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. We actually we have, we have two raised hands at the moment, and I would um, suggest that we take these two questions and then we uh, see um, for, for whom or if the entire panel wants to react. So the first uh, person that I would like to invite is, invite is Leonard Gerrig, if I pronounce the name right. Please yeah. ask a question. Good luck, thank you. Um, it is for uh, Mr. Mitford. Thank you for your input. I would like to ask a follow-up question. Um, we have heard before in other talks that um, um, the EU and Japan follow a human-centered approach and um, from another input that we can expect the decentralization in the nature of work and social organization following the current crisis. So I would like to know how much can we expect the green revolution to be decentralized itself in terms of technology, infrastructure and energy production as a whole? Thank you. That is a great question and something I didn't really have a chance to talk about. One part of smart grids and renewable energy is also a decentralization of electricity production. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> away yeah, from. Can I, can, can I take? Can I take one more question? Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, 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 Marie, so the back, please. Could you pose your question to the audience? Or yeah, Anna? I just wanted to connect to Verena and uh, Maike concerning <laughs> what is being done in the strategic partnership agreement, and I want to point out that there is a facility in in Tokyo from the European side working on this and they put together teams already to go to the Central Asia, uh, Africa and uh, Eastern Europe Balkan to go Japanese and European teams together and talk with the people there and see what is needed. I mean we need to ask the countries also what is needed and we'll create uh, projects after those visits. They have been postponed due to COVID-19 but I'm sure that they will take place and we will get some concrete cases where we can see cooperation. I think that would be very important. Thank you very much. So, Paul, cool. now the screen is yours, and we go back to Murray's question. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, sorry to have jumped the gun there. So as I was saying, that that's an excellent question. Uh, an important part of uh, the spread of renewable energy is this shift from centralization of, of generation from large fossil fuel plants or nuclear power plants where you have these large centralized facilities and then grids going out regionally or nationally to much more decentralized and even local grids. And this is um, good for the environment. It's also a way to deal with uh, climate change and particularly um, uh, natural disasters and, and things such as typhoons that Japan has a lot of because uh, when you have one big national grid, when you have an earthquake like you did in 311, March 11, 2011, the whole system goes down. Even areas that produce their own uh, solar or wind electricity uh, in 2011 had no electricity because they were connected to the central grid. So the Abe administration, which is not known uh, of, as having been a big fan of renewable energy, um, started in the last year to really promote renewable energy and local grids as a form of resilience towards natu uh, natural disasters. This is in particular response to a typhoon in uh, just east of Tokyo last year where uh, the, uh, the grid went down and was down for many weeks. Uh, and again, this was a centralized grid. And since that time, there's been a real move in Japan towards promoting rooftop solar and batteries for homes and also localized networks that are not might will not fall like a cascade of, of uh, dominoes when something goes wrong in one part of the system. So decentralization of um, electricity production and distribution, I think is a major trend we're going to see uh, moving forward. And, and an area again, where Japan and the EU can cooperate. I think Japan is probably getting out a little bit ahead of the EU in terms of looking at, at uh, decentralization as a way to deal with natural disasters, perhaps, partly because Japan has a lot of them, but I'll leave it there, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, any 
one in the panel that wants to take up the uh, question from Marie on the SDA and, and moving forward and different parts of that in the post-COVID world. Dr. Witte, please. Yeah, two points. I mean, um, the uh, project Ms. Söderberg mentioned, that's the one I also mentioned, the enhancing security in and with Asia. And uh, Germany supports this also on a bilateral basis. We uh, put quite some funds into this because it's really uh, uh, important to have this country by country approach and also listen to the countries concerned. And I'm really uh, hopeful that this, this new approach will give a new dimension, especially because it's led by the EU for, for dealing with uh, the countries in the Asia-Pacific region and in Africa. And then on the question of uh, di digital um, ODA, this has also a geopolitical side. Yeah, you have uh, the uh, great efforts of Japan to build uh, data networks, undersea cables in the Pacific regions, clearly to provide also alternatives to other, other players in this field. And uh, these are just ideas which are open where we can think together with the Japanese what you can do. And I wanted to point out that uh, next March, the European Union will join Japan and the United States for the first time in hosting a cybersecurity training for the Indo-Pacific region, also as an uh, outcome or on the basis of the SPA. So also in those fields, there are many specific uh, issues where the cooperation has been enhanced. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I had some trouble here. <laughs> May I respond to that? If um, it seems that um, perhaps our uh, our whole Patrick is, is not with us, but I, if if I may, then um, respond to this because indeed the uh, SIVA project that you mentioned, uh, Mr. Fitz, I think that's an excellent example of how particularly Germany, um, but also France, of course, with the EU. Um, is, is trying to deepen the country-to-country -country cooperation. Um, at the same time, from my little understanding of it, um, what I would love to see more here is um, cooperation also on the non-traditional security elements. It seems that, um, of course, also non-traditional security is on the agenda there, um, but it seems to be focused mostly towards, for example, terrorism um, issues, whereas I do think cybersecurity is, uh, is an a, a especially um, promising field uh, where the Japanese side, in my view, is, is wanting to really cooperate with the EU. So it's really a pity if the sort of the, uh, the outlines of the project of SCIVA do not allow for that. Um, this is where I see sometimes uh, the bureaucratic structures intervening with the real potential or the real need for, um, for cooperation. Um, and perhaps uh, allow me also, I'm not sure, uh, but I think that the, the instrument that Marie was, was mentioning is, is a different one. It's not um, the, the security in and with Asia project, but it's a partnership instrument um, that tries to facilitate uh, more discussion between Japan and the EU, um, which I believe is, is a different set of issues. So I think we have two examples here of how the EU in recent years has been really trying to deepen um, dialogue uh, with Japan. Um, and perhaps a final point, I saw a question on, on uh, South Korea and the potential to cooperate with uh, South Korea. Um, yes, indeed, I did not specifically mention South Korea. I do think in the, in, in the, the field that I address, digital, um, there's great opportunities. Of course, uh, South Korea is also very enhanced. I consider this to be part of the Indo-Pacific sort of efforts where we see um, cooperation, not just bilaterally, um, but also with countries, also Singapore, which has some, a very different approach than uh, European countries to the digital, uh, many digital things. 
um, but it's also extremely knowledgeable um, and has some, I think, uh, best practices that we in Europe should learn from. And the same, again, should be uh, said, of course, of, of South Korea, but we couldn't, didn't have time to mention specific individual countries uh, in, in much detail, hence uh, I didn't mention it. Yeah. Hopefully maybe, maybe. Patrick is back now. Okay. No, not yet. So I think I will just take the liberty to jump in uh, because we have eight minutes left. And um, in that way, it may be, may be good to go around the panel one more time yeah. for a final statement. Um, maybe something that you didn't have a chance to address during the Q&A that you would like to bring in. Uh, maybe also, if you feel, uh, give, us some, uh, give us some impressions um, of uh, issues that may very very well be worth discussing in more detail next year when we have a real conference because indeed uh, a lot of the issues that you brought up uh, just in the discussion in the Q&A sound really fascinating and would very well uh, deserve being discussed in more detail and I see from Sven Trashevsky that Patrick has just returned so in I that really way um, I will I will definitely not um, kind of monopolize the space any longer, Patrick. I just did a transition towards the final statement, but maybe you want to introduce that. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. No, I think we were coming up to the end, uh, and we had a lot of, of interesting discussions. So um, I think that we should should do a quick round for the um, panel to have some final, very short remarks, and after that we will hand over to um, uh, Dr. Holtgren again. So. Uh, should we start uh, with um, Dr. Witte? Any final remarks? Yes, maybe a, a kind of a, a personal approach to all this because um, what I would like to see more that uh, the EU and Japan uh, cooperate more on the structures in the region, on ASEAN and on the Pacific Island Forum. We both have our long-standing uh, cooperation mechanisms, but they, they are in parallel. Yeah, and we both have our fora where we don't even invite each other. So, I mean, there is a clearly a space for more cooperation, and I, I bring this up in all kinds of uh, fora, but I, I hope we can do more. Yeah, and I'm really envious of the ASEAN Center here in Tokyo. I think we should have something like this in Brussels as well. Yeah, so the Japanese kind of pay for a lobbying institution for ASEAN to bring all the issues of ASEAN here in the, in the political consciousness of this country. I like this idea very much. So that's my last remark. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Then we switch to uh, Uemura-san. Any final remarks and comments? Okay, so I just would like to mention about you know, RCEP. So as you know, the RCEP was you know, agreed and uh, in this sense, you know, the, since you know, Japan is uh, you know, partner of the uh, EU through the EPA, SPA, so even though the EU uh, is not a member of the RCEP, but uh, if the EU uh, will uh, support or uh, participate in the project uh, the Japan is working on uh, through the RCEP, so the EU uh, indirectly uh, participate in the RCEP, uh, the the possibility so that the uh, it could be interesting for uh, us to uh, consider such kind of uh, cooperation uh, between the EU and Japan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Any final comments? Uh, not not too much. I guess I would just kind of re uh, reemphasize one of the things I said just a moment ago, which is for in terms of a topic next year. I think. More generally, uh, I think disaster resilience is something, an important topic between the EU and Japan. I mean, at the military level, in terms of uh, joint military exercises uh, for disaster relief, Japan does that already uh, with Asian partners through uh, the uh, ARF, through something called the uh, uh, Asia Index exercises. That should happen bilaterally, but also, again, in terms of renewable energy. Uh, as a more uh, disaster uh, resistant type of technology. Also, we talked about sustainable connectivity between Japan and, and the EU and particularly uh, countries in between, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region. There also, I think ODA uh, and uh, cooperation related to promoting renewable energy in third countries. Also, again, the important infrastructure that goes along with that smart grids, 
uh, storage batteries, other forms of storage. Those are also areas where I think we should highlight um, uh, opportunities for future cooperation. I'll leave it there. Thank you again for yeah. organizing Thank you very much. today. We also had a comment from the audience that, that uh, we, we do not touch uh, or haven't talked about the uh, combination of the relation between EU, Japan, and, and Korea, where Korea comes in uh, both in terms of security aspects and, and uh, the economic point of view. And I think that that's something that we could possibly take with, with us for, for the future, in, and particularly now with the comments of uh, Umura san with the RCEP and how that would connect to, to uh, uh, global and regional production networks. So, Mike, any final comments from your side? Yes, thank you. Um, I guess I, I want to relate to what uh, uh, Mr. Uemura just said um, on, uh, on, on RCEP. I, I do think indeed that um, in the EU, some people have been calling this trade policy light and, and dismissing it as, as if it's uh, um, you know, not very important. I think it is indeed very important to, to notice how this uh, agreement also binds countries in the region to China. So it's, uh, it shows how they are not wanting to, to, to pick sides again. Um, and to engage with China continuously, and the EU has uh, taking a, is taking a similar approach. Um, so we, I think we should engage with this, um, and ideally, actually, take this uh, help to take this up to higher standards. China has, of course, indicated that it now also wants to join CPTPP. Uh, well, let's see if they can uh, stick to uh, achieve that standard. But specifically on, on e-commerce, I think this chapter, which also, um, as I mentioned in the chat mentions uh, a ban on data localization, which is something I think that the EU is also supportive of. Um, so we have to recognize uh, the small steps that are being taken uh, in a way that uh, meets EU interests on regulatory cooperation. And I think we would do well to engage more there. Excellent, thank you very much. And Axel, you have uh, 30 seconds. I know it might be difficult, uh, but you can do it. Uh, uh, of course, I'll, I'll do it very quickly. Yeah, the, uh, just taking up, I mean, Mike replied to this already. Maybe it's, it's easier if you talk about digital, um, uh, you know, cooperation. But if you, you know, tempting, you know, Takeda-san, Takeda-san's question from the audience to turn a bilateral, very complicated, very complex and bureaucratic relationship uh, into a trilateral one. I think it's also, it's, I think, I don't want to spoil the party, but I think it's very difficult. If you look at the, the resources that are available in the European Union and in Japan to deal with all the meetings, with all the procedures, then turning into a trilateral event sounds good, uh, very tempting. Uh, and we always uh, expand to trilateral um, you know, configurations, but doing this in practice, I think is, uh, is, uh, is, is very difficult, right? Already, you know, if you look at the nitty gritty business and I finish uh, of, of EU Japan cooperation on an institution level, it is very, very, very complicated, you know, and we are more digital now, we are used to communicate, communicate uh, over the web and we don't have to meet each other all the time, but, you know, turning this into a trilateral full-fledged relationship, um, you know, uh, sounds good, but it's probably uh, bureaucratically and uh, administratively fairly difficult. But it's a Thank good you idea. very much. I, I take yeah. it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Axel. Thank you very much to our great panelists uh, for, for joining us today with uh, very interesting comments and, and discussion points. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much to, to all the audience. Um, and I would now hand over the final word to Dr. Holtgren, please. Yes, well, thank you all very much, Professor Ström and our distinguished speakers for this inspiring discussion. And now we have unfortunately already reached the end of our program today, but I'm sure that there will be the opportunity to continue the discussion um, throughout the next year and especially during uh, the next EJAN conference in 2021. So at the end, please give me the opportunity for some more final remarks. Um, First, I would like to draw your attention that uh, the video of this event will stay on the Japanese German Center Berlin's YouTube channel. So you can watch it once again if you would like to do so. And please also invite your colleagues who we are not able to join us today to watch it later on. Um, if I may also draw your attention to one more upcoming virtual event at the Japanese German Center Berlin. So on Thursday and Friday next week, December 3rd and 4th, 
the JDZB in cooperation with the German Federal Foreign Office, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung and the Japan Institute of International Affairs will host a two day virtual symposium on the topic of nuclear disarmament, arms control and non proliferation. German and Japanese perspectives ahead of the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference, which will be opened uh, with a keynote speech by the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, Ms. Nakamitsu. If you would like to participate during this upcoming event, uh, we kindly ask you to register urgently via our website because the deadline is today at midnight Central European time. And now to officially close the event, I would like to thank all of you once again very much, our distinguished speakers, the chair, Professor Ström. I do thank very much our cooperation partners, Professor Söderberg and Professor blechinger talcott It was a great pleasure and I sincerely hope that the Japanese-German Center Berlin can also work together with you in the future. And last but not least, I would like to thank our virtual audience for participation. Thank you very much. Have a good evening in Japan, a good afternoon in Europe, and goodbye from the virtual Japanese-German Center Berlin. <laughs>